I believe in Hashem. I trust in Hashem. There never is a moment when that I am alone and I'm on my own. I believe and I trust in Hashem because I understand that He's holding my hand and every step is perfectly planned. He's holding me tight, so I'll be all right. I believe and I trust in Hashem. We are in a very special month of Kislev. It's the month that has the big, big Yontif of Yutas Kislev. Followed by Hanukkah. And one thing we see by both, Hanukkah brought a lot of light to the world, and Yutas Kislev brought a lot of light, the light of Hasidus. Hasidus teaches us how special and pure every Yid is. Even if on the outside you don't see it, inside he has an neshama, and he's really, really special. And if you look at him with the good eye, the good will come out, and he will be good on the outside too. So before I tell you the story that I have for you today, I want to remind you of something which I already mentioned. One of the very important things that we know from the Rebbe and the Friedrich Rebbe is to learn Chitas. Chumash, Tilim, and Tanya every day. And if you do so, it brings you many, many brachas. Chitas didn't actually begin in the times of the Friedrich Rebbe. Actually, it's all the way back from the times of the Baal Shem Toif. Yes? Let me tell you the story. You probably know it, but it's always good to hear it. A story again. The Tzemach Tzedek once sent his son, the Rebbe Maharash, on a mission to go to Petersburg, the capital city of Russia, to fight off a terrible gezera, <clears throat> a decree which would chas v'shalom affect all the yeshivas and all the Yiddish kindalach learning Torah, because the maskilim went ahead and they printed books, thousands of books, and they wanted to make these books go into the yeshivas and to all the schools where Yiddish children are learning. And now all they need was permission from the government to enforce and push these books into the schools. What was wrong with these books? They had everything against Torah and mitzvahs, against believing in Hashem, against anything of the Torah. So the Tzemach Tzedek sent the Rebbe Maharash, go fight off this Gezerah. Before he left, the Tzemach Tzedek said, I want to tell you something that you're going to do there. I'll give you instructions when you get there. And you will have atzlacha. It would work. You will have success. And something that I did when I had to go to Petersburg many, many years ago to fight off another gezerah, another decree. Let me tell you what it was. Samach Tzedek said like this. On the way to Petersburg, I stopped off at the oihel of my mother, Rebetzin Devarileya. Devarileya was the daughter of the Alter Rebbe, and she was the mother of the Tzemach Tzedek. She gave up her life to save Hasidim and Hasidus. When the Tzemach Tzedek was a young boy, that's when his mother passed away. So he came to the oil of his mother, Devarileya, to get a special bracha on such a special mission. And his mother said to him, 
I was at the Baal Shem Tov's Heichel, his part in Gan Eden. I was able to visit the Baal Shem Tov. I was given the privilege because I gave my life for Hasidim and Hasidus. And I came to the Baal Shem Tov and I said, I need a skula, special thing that we can do so that my son, Menachem Mendel, the Tzemach Tzedek, should be able to be safe and come out successfully. And the Varele is now telling this to the Tzemach Tzedek, and Tzemach Tzedek is telling it over to the Rebbe Maharash. He says, my mother said to me that the, the Baal Shem Tev said, your son, the Tzemach Tzedek, knows the entire Chumash, the entire Tilim, and the entire Tanya perfectly with all the words. And whoever knows all of this, you should know they get a special protection from Hashem. And the Baal Shem Tev said, we see it in the Pasuk in Chumash. There's a Pasuk, it's talking about Yaakov Avinu going with his children returning back to Canaan. It says, everybody was afraid of him. No one wanted to disturb him or his family. No one wanted to start up with him. And what's the Pasuk say? Vayihi chitas eloikim al ha'arim. That was the chitas, the fear of Hashem on all of the nations, of all the cities, and no one bothered them. Said the Baal Shem Tev, the word chitas, which means fear, is also means something else. Chitas has three letters. Ches, tough, saf. Ches stands for chumish. Tough stands for tilim. And the next tough for tanya. And the Baal Shem Tev said, whoever knows chumish, tilim, and tanya is protected. And this shows us how important it is to learn Chitas. And the Tzemach Tzedek, when he finished telling this story to the Rebbe Maharash, he says, now you're going on the mission. Listen what I want you to do. When you get there in Petersburg, all the offices that you go to, the ministers, make sure you say Chitas. Chumash, Tilim, Tanya. Say a parsha of Chumash, a capital Tilim, and a parak of Tanya. And you'll be successful with Hashem's help. And the Rebbe Maharash went there, and when he came back, he said, Baruch Hashem, I was successful. My Tati's instructions was excellent. It was a perfect recipe. I came there, and I was saying Chumash, I said, Three parshiyas of Chumash, three kapit lachtilim, and three parakim of Tanya. And guess what? All of the plans of the Maskilim fell apart. They were destroyed to such an extent that the head of the Maskilim decided to run away from the country to escape because the government was upset with him that he made them waste so much money on printing all those books that are now all going to the garbage. This shows us the great power of Chitas. Learning Chumash, Tilim, and Tanya. And I want you to know, just like when we say Tehillim, we don't understand the words, so too, if you say the Chumash, or you say the Tanya, even if you don't understand the words, say it. It still protects you. It still has all the good things of Chitas. Because we're in the month of Kislev, and we're getting to Rosh Hashanah Tachsidus, it's a very good time to make a hachlata, make a decision. From now on, Chitas. And I will tell you something that happened with me. When I was when I turned 14 years old, a year after Bar Mitzvah, I had a big schuss 
to go in to Yechidus alone to the Rebbe to get a bracha for my birthday. And when I came in, the Rebbe gave me a bracha, and then the Rebbe asked me, so do you learn chitas every day? And unfortunately, I did not say yes. You know why? I wanted to be honest. Yeah, I did learn chitas once in a while, but I wasn't as careful as I should. And the Rebbe looked at me and said, now that you're 14 years old, you should learn chitas every day. Yes, it's so important. It brings many, many brachis. Now we're ready for a story. We just heard a story, but here's the story for this week. This story happened about 200 years ago, at the time of the Kantanistin. Who are the Kantanistin? They are Yiddish children who are taken away from their families at a young age, because the Tsar, the king of Russia, wanted them to serve in the army. But you can't serve in the army and become a soldier till you're 18. But he didn't want them to come as Yidin. He didn't want them to come with Taira and Mitzvahs, because then he's going to have a hard time with them. They won't be able to do Taira and Mitzvahs in the army. So you know what the Tsar did? A terrible plan. He took the children that they were young, seven, eight years old, and took them away, kidnapped them from their parents, and sent them to Goisha places, and forced them not to be able to do Taito Mitzvahs, and to eat things they're not allowed to, and many, many thousands of Yiddish Kindlach were forced. But I want to tell you something. Many, many of them did not give in to the Goyim. They went Mesiras Nechesh. The Kantanistin, these little children, fought with all their might to stay close to Hashem and not to give up their Yiddishkeit. While some others couldn't Hold out, and many of them forgot that they're Yidden. The story I'm going to tell you is about a soldier, we'll call him Moshe. And he was such a special soldier, even though he was taken away from his parents when he was a kid, and he served in the army already, and he doesn't even know if his parents are still alive. But he did something of Mesira Snefesh to give up his life for Hashem. And because of that, guess what? The Tsar took off the Gezeira, the decree, and stopped taking young children. And here is the story. The Tsar was once sitting in his palace and he thought to himself, I wonder what the people in the town think about me. What do they speak about the Tsar? What do they say about the Tsar? He was very curious to find out. So what did he do? He went and dressed up in plain, simple clothes. He put on a t-shirt, a pair of, of jeans or jogging pants, and simple-looking shoes and a funny cap, and went out to the streets. Nobody at all was able to recognize him that this is the czar. He just looked like any plain person. And he would walk between the people and listen into their conversations. One time, he walked into a bar. What happens when you walk into a bar? Well, if it's a bar like this, and you walk into it, you say, ouch. But that's not the bar I'm talking about. A bar is like a restaurant serves food. A bar serves drinks like vodka, mashke, all different kind of drinks, where you find goyim, peasants, soldiers. So one day, he walked into a bar, 
and sat down near one of the soldiers in the barn. The soldier did not know who he is, didn't realize it's the czar. The soldier right away took a glass and filled up a glass of mashka, a vodka, and gave it to him to drink. And the czar wanted to pretend that he's a plain guy, so he drank it. When he finished, he put the empty glass back on the table. The soldier right away gave him a big slap on the back. And the czar says, what's the meaning of that slap? And he says, you don't know the rules? You're never supposed to leave an empty glass. You're supposed to fill it up again. And the czar filled it up again and drank it. And then the soldier drank and they took turns until the bottle was empty. As if they were not drunk enough, the soldier decided he needs another bottle. So he ordered another bottle, but they wouldn't give it to him without money. They want full pay. But he didn't have any more money. He used up his last coins on the first bottle. But he wants the bottle. So he took his sword that he was carrying with him, pulled the sword out of the case, and gave it as a mashkin, as a collateral. He said, hold on to my sword, and I will bring you the money. You know I can't leave the sword by you. I must have it. I'm a soldier. So you know for sure I'm going to come back to pay you. Just give me that bottle of mashka. And they took the sword from him and put it away and gave him a bottle of mashka. And he and the czar finished the entire bottle. When they finished drinking, they both barely were able to get out of the bar. They walked arm in arm like two buddies. But the as shaker as they were, as drunk as they were, <coughs> the czar held in mind, he wanted to know, where is this soldier from? And he said, which army base, which regiment do you work in? And the soldier told him. He didn't know he's telling it to the czar. And they went on their ways. The next day, early in the morning, the commander in the army base made an announcement. Your attention, all soldiers, your attention, please. The czar is making a tour inspection. Everyone get ready. And they heard this. The whole army base, everybody ran to clean, to sweep, to make sure their uniform is perfect. Because the czar, if he found anything wrong, he can give the biggest punishment. Now you can imagine what this soldier, as I said, his name was Moshe. What is Moshe going to do now? He doesn't have a sword. The sword is by the bar. And it's going to take a few days for him to get the money to pay up. And what is he going to do if the czar finds him without a sword? But he thought of a clever idea. He went and carved out from a piece of wood an imitation sword. The shape of a sword, it looked exactly like it. It was just made out of wood. And he put it into his case. And he got in line with everybody. The czar is now making the inspection. And he's going down row after row of soldiers. All the soldiers are standing there in their uniform with a salute. And the czar stops right in front of Moshe. Of course, that's the one he was looking for. When he stops in front of Moshe, Moshe got scared and frightened. We didn't say a word yet. The czar turned to the soldier next to Moshe and said, That's the way you come with your uniform? Look at it. 
That's the best you can do? And the soldier next to Misha didn't know what to answer. You can't argue with the czar, even though he knew that everything was spotless. He said to the czar, please, the czar should forgive me. I did my best, and next time I will do better. Seems like the czar didn't care what he's saying. The czar turned to Misha, and he said to him, pull out your sword and chop off his head. Hmm. What is Maisha supposed to do? He can't ignore the command of the Tsar because then he'll be killed. To pull out a sword? <laughs> First of all, why should he kill an innocent person? Second of all, he, can't, he has nothing to pull out, a piece of wood. He's stuck. But the to put an idea into his mind. He right away said to the Tsar, his Majesty the Tsar, I'm ready to carry out the Tsar's command. But since there is a possibility that he might be innocent, he doesn't deserve to be killed. So for that possibility, I'm going to ask the Almighty, Hashem, God, that he should turn my sword into wood. And he pulled out the sword. And the czar saw that it's wood. Everybody else thought it was a miracle. But the czar knew the truth. <laughs> the czar knew that the sword was in the bar. But the czar wouldn't say anything. He couldn't say anything. What is he going to say? I drank with you yesterday. So the czar said, Okay. I excuse that soldier. And you, I want you to be promoted to become an officer. Yes, the Tsar was so impressed with the clever trick of the soldier that he promoted him to become an officer. And slowly but surely he kept on promoting him rank after rank, higher and higher, until he became one of the bodyguards of the Tsar alone. From time to time, the Tsar would speak with him. And one time, the Tsar spoke to him about religion and said to him, Tell me, are you really a believer? And do you go to cloister, to church every week? Moshe said, of course I'm a believer, but I never go there. I don't go to a cloister. I'm a Jew. The czar turned white. He says, you, a Jew? I kept on promoting you, thinking that you were a Christian. I didn't know you were a Jew. Well, the czar never asked me, and I'm ready to go back to be a plain soldier to serve the czar. Well, why don't we rather do this? I'm going to appoint you as a general. You'll have such a high position and you'll become my personal friend. There's only one thing you gotta do. You gotta convert and become a Christian. And he also <coughs> hinted to him that if he doesn't accept the offer, it will be very bad for him. Now, Moshe, who grew up without any Yidden around him, not knowing too much about Yiddishkeit, Torah, Mitzvahs, he doesn't even know if his parents are alive. So he thought, I'll say yes, but I'll just do it make-believe. I'll pretend. And he said yes. And the Tsar was so happy. He made up a time and a day that they're going to go to Kiev. Over there, they're going to go to the chief Galach, the priest, who's going to do the ceremony 
and you become a Christian. The day came, the Tsar and the Tsarina, his wife, and Maisha are in the wagon, and they're driving. Now you should, you would think, out of after so many promises from the Tsar, he's going to get honor, riches, be the close friend. You think Maisha was so happy? Not at all. His conscience was bothering him, and he thought to himself. How did I make such a terrible mistake to even answer yes for make-believe? I know what's wrong. I'm not doing it. He thought to himself, I'm not going to do it even to pretend. Not even to make-believe. As they were traveling, they were going over a bridge in, one, in the city. And the bridge was going over a river. Suddenly, Moshe jumped out of the wagon and called out on the top of his voice, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Aleikeinu, Hashem Echad. And he jumped over the bridge into the water and disappeared from the eyes of the Tsar. The Tsar and the Tsarina were shocked. And they turned back to go back home. Now the Tsar was so closely attached to this Yid, to Maisha, that he started to think, is it the right thing to do this to the Jewish people? Is it right to force them to become a guy, to become a Christian? And he decided there and then, that he's taking off this decree, and since then, there was no more decree of the continists. From then on, the Yidden were all free to be able to learn Tyra and do mitzvahs. What do we see from this story? The Alter Rebbe, who gave us Tanya, teaches us to look at the inside of every Yid, see how pure he is, how good he is, like you see in the story. That even though he was thinking of who knows what he'll get, but then his, the goodness, his neshama inside woke him up and brought him back to Hashem. A good yantif, the shana teiva, the lima da chesidus, the dake achesidus, the kosevu, the sechesemu.